This is The Red Line, where we interview three geopolitical experts on one big issue shaping the news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. 50 million dollars. Well, 47.8 million to be precise. That's a lot of money to you and me. But let's put it in some context. That's one apartment block in China. That's less than what the US government spends on paper clips each year. And it's also the same amount Australia has put towards assisting Bougainville. Not only likely to be the world's newest democratic nation, but a nation with the largest copper reserves in the world, having an estimated reserve of 1 billion tons of ore copper and 12 million ounces of gold. The mine alone is worth $75 billion, and everyone from China to Canada to New Zealand is lining up to form ties with this upcoming nation. And even though this new nation is only 1,000 kilometers from Australia's shores, Canberra has no policy set in stone. The island I'm referring to is called Bougainville, on the easternmost reaches of Papua New Guinea. The island is ethnically Melanesian, but has been under the rulership of Papua New Guinea since independence. After a years-long bloody civil war and an overwhelmingly positive referendum, the people of Bougainville have decided to seek the path of independence and step out onto the world stage on its own. Whilst the island was part of Papua New Guinea, it followed the foreign policy of Port Moresby, walking step in step with Australia. But now that it's out on its own, other nations are beginning to court the island's leadership before the divorce with Papua New Guinea has even been finalised. The Solomons, China, Canada and Indonesia are all laying solid foundations in Wuka, but Australia seems to still be sitting on the fence. Will the deep resource pot of Papua New Guinea be vacuumed up by Beijing, who can outbid what Australia is putting forward with pocket change? Or will the long-standing ties between Australia and the Papuans keep Bougainville looking southward? This week, we take a look at Bougainville, Papua New Guinea, the Solomons, and Melanesia, as well as the current battle for influence unfolding in the region. And to take us through some of the background here, we turn to our first guest. Part 1. From the Snow to the Jungle Well, Papua New Guinea is Australia's closest neighbour, um, which isn't always fully appreciated. At the closest point, they're at literally just like a few kilometres apart. Bougainville is an autonomous region within Papua New Guinea. So Papua New Guinea's population is probably around the 10 million mark. Uh, Bougainville is more like 300,000. The Bougainvillean people have a very strong cultural and ethnic identity. Uh, they see themselves, or in generally they see themselves as more closely connected with the people of Northern Solomon Islands than of Papua New Guinea. And I guess the one, you know, the, the big the big question or the big issue is that uh, during the 1980s, there was a, a, a long and protracted, extremely uh, traumatic civil war on Bougainville in which Bougainvillean resistance fighters fought against uh, Papua New Guinean soldiers um, and you know sort of since then since the a peace agreement was brought into force um, we've been in a, a long steady process um, around what what happens next for Bougainville in terms of moving from being auto, semi-autonomous or autonomous within Papua New Guinea to becoming a country in their own right. Tess Newton Kane is the program leader at the Pacific Hub at Griffith University. Tess is one of the leading policy writers when it comes to policy for the Pacific Island nations, and we're thrilled to have her back on the program today. Okay, so so Papua New Guinea is a is a is a big country with extremely it's extremely diverse culturally and socially, and it also has extremely challenging topography, both in terms of rivers and mountains and goodness knows what else. So the reach of the nation state is severely limited in Papua New Guinea. So once you get out of Port Moresby or, or the, the National Capital District, then the national government becomes fairly invisible fairly quickly. There is an established system of provincial governments and even low, there are lower levels of governments as well. So local government areas. Um, 
and they are in terms of their ability to deliver services to their populations that that's a variable a variable picture so some some provincial and local governments function quite well others don't um, but generally service delivery and access to services for the greater population and bearing in mind that about three quarters of the population lives in a rural area. Access to services in Papua New Guinea generally and, and, in, and on Bougainville is a very challenging issue and lots of people live their lives without much by way of service support from the state, whether that's in relation to infrastructure, health, education, uh, telephone, IT services, all of those things, it's very it's very patchy whether that, that you have access to those things if you're not in a major um, a major urban area and even if you are ensuring consistency of those services is not not always guaranteed even without the united infrastructure across the country is there a Papuan identity how similar is someone from port moresby the capital on the south coast to someone in madang on the north coast or buka in bougainville I mean, they are very diverse and, and in some ways quite, there's quite a strong sort of, there's quite strong regional divides. So whilst there have certainly been lots of intermarriages and, you know, whatever else, and some people, particularly in Port Moresby, might say, oh, well, you know, I'm part Madang and part Enger or I'm, you know, my mum's from the Highlands and my dad's from East New Britain. Once you get out into the regions, then no, people don't have that sort of mixed um, heritage and so yes the the people from the people from Booker uh, and the people from you know Madang could be would consider themselves as different as the people from Madang would consider themselves from Australians or Americans you know they, they, they really are very very uh, different very ethnically diverse linguistically separate so as with most Melanesian countries, Papua New Guineans will often speak three or four languages, but it's it's not beyond the realms of possibility that you could have, you know, someone from Booker and someone from somewhere else in Papua New Guinea in the country and them not really have much of a language in common except possibly some English, depending on how much education they've had. So you mentioned it a little earlier on, but ethnically the far eastern island of Bougainville has far more in common with the northern Solomon Islands than it does with PNG. So why were they included in Papua New Guinea during the decolonization period rather than the Solomons? Well, at the time that Papua New Guinea was was seeking independence from Australia or Australia was seeking to make Papua New Guinea independent, uh, Bougainville, that was, you know, one of the earliest points at which Bougainville said, actually, we'd like to be, we'd like to be our own country. We'd like to be separate. Um, and that was not that was kind of quashed or, or not really entertained by the Australian administration, who were the ones, de, you know, devolving to independence. And part of the reason for that is comes back to Panguna. Um, so this is the big mine that Rio Tinto Bougainville Copper had on Bougainville. Um, at one point, it was the biggest mine of its type in the world. Um, it was contributing a huge amount to the Papua New Guinean economy and was, was basically seen as part of the, you know, one of the planks on which economic um, independence and economic sustainability could be built for the new country of Papua New Guinea. So there was very, very little uh, appetite on the part of the people that were putting together what was going to be Papua New Guinea to you know, basically sell off the family silver or the family copper. What ensued here was years of long civil war on the island, which eventually led to a ceasefire and then a referendum to take place on the island on whether Bougainville should become an independent nation from Papua New Guinea. The referendum took place in 2019, with 98.3% of the voters voting for independence. Can you take us through this referendum, how significant it is for the island? Well, the, the, there wasn't a choice, really. The, the Bougainville Peace Agreement stipulated that there had to be a referendum on independence by, you know, 2019 was kind of the last, the last possible time. It could have gone into 2020, but given what happened with COVID, it was probably just as well. It wasn't delivered or it wasn't delayed. But 2020 was when it had to happen and it was decided to have it at the end of 2019 so that it didn't 
get caught up in the next round of um, provincial and presidential elections on Bougainville. So that was always that was always the plan um, as part of the Bougainville peace agreement that there would be this this journey towards a referendum. There were several aspects to what needed to happen. So basically. Um, the weapons had to be surrendered and a large number of weapons were surrendered and secured, you know, buried in concrete vaults. There had to be um, a, a, a program of sort of awareness raising and, and civic education about what independence might mean and how a referendum might work, how a referendum works, how it's different from other other types of elections. So there was a, you know, a fair amount of work that was needed in order to uh, get the role fully correct, make sure that everybody was who was eligible to take part in that referendum was registered and able to do so. So it was, it was quite a long, a long process. Um, and yeah, eventuating in this in this referendum that we saw take place at the end of 2019. And I mean, I think so. one of the issues about the Bougainville Peace Agreement was it sustained for 20 years. And, and looking across the globe, that's not something that's always very common. Often agreements that are secured in environments such as this can be quite fragile. And we often see reversions back into or, you know, sort of slipping back into violence. Um, we didn't see that in Bougainville. That's not to say there weren't um, ongoing tensions and there weren't possibly some, um, you know, it's very small skirmishes, but nothing like a, a, a reignition of the civil war. And were other countries like Australia and China pushing Bougainville to seek independence or was it a very homegrown independence movement? And why was Bougainville's independence movement so successful as compared to New Caledonia's independence movement, which voted no and voted against independence from the French? Whilst there are certainly some similarities between Bougainville and um, New Caledonia, I think it's important to remember that, you know, 99% of the people that live in Bougainville are Bougainvillians. They are indigenous Bougainvillians. That's where they've, you know, they, their ancestors have occupied that, that land for um, centuries. And, you know, this has been part of part of what they they have fought for or their fathers and uncles fought for so that you know it's always been very much an issue for them the the relationship between bougainville and papua new guinea um administratively is not necessarily as beneficial as between new caledonia and france so for example uh, one of the grievances that the bougainvillian administration has is that funding that they've been promised and that the Bougainville Peace Agreement envisaged from Papua New Guinea to Bougainville in order for them to build up their resources and their human capital and all of that sort of thing, that hasn't necessarily been forthcoming. So they've never received as much as they were promised. And that's one of the issues that's been in the, been involved in the current negotiations as to what happens next. So. Whereas, you know, in New Caledonia, there might be people thinking, well, you know, we might not get that money from France. In Bougainville, it's more like, well, we don't really get much from Papua New Guinea as it is. So maybe we'd be better off. You know, we're not really missing out on anything. In terms of other countries pushing, I think certainly within the Melanesian spearhead group, uh, in which Vanuatu, Solomon Islands, Fiji and Papua New Guinea are members, you know, that idea of self-determination and sovereignty, that the, they're very strong tenets of that group. And so they've certainly been very supportive of the people of Bougainville voting for independence. Um, Australia, I think, was quite, you know, didn't want to have a, a bet either way. Um, you know, I, I don't know that Australia would, would have a position on that. Um, and, you know, certainly I don't, I, I, I didn't get any sense that there was a particularly strong Australian push for Bougainville to become independent. So, you know, I think it's just too overwhelming, overwhelmingly conclusive to put it down to much other than a, a very strongly rooted historical and cultural belief that we are our own people and we want to decide our own destiny. 
Well, obviously PNG is still drawing out this process at the moment, and we'll discuss that further in the episode, but when Bougainville does gain its independence, who is it likely to turn to for allies? Well, I think it's an important question. I think um, I think for the people of Bougainville, that question is important, but there are other questions which rate more highly. So, for example, and we've seen quite recently um, references to you know a real lack of human capital within Bougainville in really critical sectors, particularly health and education. So I know that the you know there's already moves to start training up lots of teachers because currently the teachers that work in Bougainville are predominantly mainland Papua New Guineans, and so they may move they may decide to move on they may not they may not want to stay in Bougainville when Bougainville becomes an independent country. The same applies in the health sector. So in terms of what people on the ground want for themselves and their families and their communities. You know, I think they're going to be focused much more on, are we going to have any, um, are we going to have enough teachers? Are we going to have enough doctors and nurses? You know, is there going to be infrastructure, all of that sort of thing? How are we going to maintain our livelihoods? Issue And issues of who are we going to be friends with are possibly of a secondary concern, but obviously are still connected to that because it may well be that Bougainville will require some foreign assistance. And in the in a recent budget, uh, Prime Minister Marape uh, made it clear or de- 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 declared or said that he was happy for Bougainville to have its own conversations with development partners. Um, which you know, which basically means if Australia or the US or China or Japan wants to talk, you know, as a development partner for Bougainville, they don't need to go through Waigani first. They can have a conversation directly with the government in Bougainville, and the government, the the new government, has already has also established established last year the uh, a business arm which is called the Bougainville Public Investment Corporation Limited. And this is basically Bougainville's way of saying we're open for business. We see foreign direct investment as being a part of our economic future. And we're keen to talk to people who want to be part of of what we want to do. And the first cab off the rank or one of the first cabs off the rank is a joint venture with South Korean partners um, across which envisages investments across a range of a range of issues so you know there's go, there's going to be more of that so these conversations are underway are ongoing and certainly Bougainville would be looking to to develop those relationships as much as Port Moresby has said they are fine with countries directly negotiating with Bougainville is it a worry in Australia that if we get too cozy with Bougainville that it may upset our delicate relationship with Papua New Guinea There are established mechanisms by which the Australian government provides support for Australian businesses that want to work in countries such as Papua New Guinea, Fiji, Vanuatu. And there's no reason why those mechanisms can't be extended or refined to encourage Australian companies to um, look at what the investment opportunities are for Bougainville or in Bougainville. Um, And I'm sure that 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 will happen. Generally, Australian companies, other than, I mean, you've got the big mining companies, obviously, but generally um, Australian companies can be quite cautious about taking on investments or entering into investments in Pacific Island countries. They find the markets, um, you know, they find that they don't have much knowledge of the markets. They find them a bit unpredictable and, and just very high risk. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see which businesses do take that take that option if they want to. In terms of um, the Australia's relationship with Papua New Guinea, yeah, it kind of that kind of assumes that Papua New Guinea's position is that they don't want to let Bougainville go, that they want you know they want to hang on to Bougainville. Um, and I think the reality is that that there are there's a range of views on that. And whilst yes, there are some people that don't want Bougainville to go, that sort of think, oh, but, you know, you're one of us and we want you to stay. There are other Papua New Guineans that are very sort of, yep, yeah, off you go. If that's what they want, then, you know, they voted and good on them. They they fought for it and they've 
maintained this peace and they, they sort of kind of deserve that reward. There is a concern in Papua New Guinea and possibly within some of the policy and strategy community in Australia that if Bougainville goes, it will kind of have a bit of a domino effect and other Papua New Guinean provinces will seek to secede. And certainly New Ireland um, has been kind of, with Julius Chan as kind of um, pipes up about this on a semi-regular basis. So there is that sense of, you know, if one goes, will will that spark them or, you know, others wanting to go. It's, it's really hard to predict what that would look like. Um, certainly the ones with, you know, resource endowments might think that they're able to um, go out on their own. Um, or they might use it as a way of, they might use the Bougainville experience as a way of seeking to exercise greater influence at national level, maybe look for greater devolvement of funding or authority. So, I mean, it, it, there's no, it's, there's no question that there could be wider impacts throughout the rest of Papua New Guinea by Bougainville taking that path. Right now, Australia spends only $50 million a year on Bougainville, which in foreign policy terms is a really a drop in the bucket. Should Australia be drastically increasing their spending here in Bougainville to get in early before they start forming ties with other nations like China? Oh, look, I think, uh, I think it's important to remember that Papua New Guinea is the largest recipient of development assistance from Australia. And in terms of two-way trade, uh, Papua New Guinea is the biggest benefactor of that. Um, it's it's very, very focused around the resources sector, and that is problematic uh, because it does mean that other sectors are underdone in Papua New Guinea, particularly the agricultural sector. Certainly, Australia has huge commitments, um, both through at the state level, through NGOs, through philanthropy, through all sorts of things um, in terms of investing in social infrastructure, particularly around health and education, gender programs. Um, it's hard, you know, it's hard to make an impact on a country that big. And the other thing to remember is that Papua New Guinea, you know, Papua New Guinea generates a lot of revenue on its own. So it doesn't, the amount of aid the aid as a proportion of the overall revenue or the overall GDP of Papua New Guinea is really quite small, um, certainly as compared with other countries. So the issues as to why, why there are no um, medicines in clinics or books in classrooms or, you know, bitumen on the roads, it's not all about, oh, well, we just need to put in more money. Um, there are some other really quite structural issues around governance capacity, around corruption, around um, just a, a lack of uh, the appropriate human capital and, you know, the political will um, that mean that, you know, whilst there might be money available, actually getting it to where it needs to be or getting what it buys to where it needs to be is a really, is just a huge, huge challenge in Papua New Guinea. So Port Moresby is dragging their feet on announcing an exact date that Bougainville will gain their independence and how that process will go forward. Why are they dragging their feet and are they hoping something might change on the ground here? Yeah, so, th I mean, it's it's a huge... It, 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 this, is the, this is the million dollar question. The, the, the terms of the Bougainville Peace Agreement are really tricky in this regard because... They do say that in the end, you know, it's all got to be worked out and have a plan and a roadmap, and then it goes to the Papua New Guinean Parliament. So it's not the government, it's the Parliament, and it has to be voted on there. And that then determines what happens. Now, that was kind of, you know, how that got in there. Tony Regan has, you know, his own thoughts about how that got in there. The fact is that it's in there. If the Papua New Guinean Parliament was to say, no, we don't accept it, you've got to stay, Legally, I guess they're they're within their rights to say that because that's what the 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 uh, agreement stipulated. Morally and politically, that would be a very very hard line for them to sell, either in Bougainville or elsewhere. I think um, you know certainly if the security partners, which is essentially Australia, New Zealand. 
and possibly Fiji and uh, maybe even the US, if they felt that they needed to somehow intervene uh, in a, a, conf a, you know, a new civil disorder situation uh, because of independence being denied, um, that, that I think would be a big ask on their, or on their part. I don't think that's something that they would look too kindly on. I think um, it would, if, if Papua New Guinea were to take that position, it would be considered quite odd by other Pacific Island countries, particularly the ones with whom they see themselves most closely aligned, which is Solomon Islands and Vanuatu, and, and to a lesser extent Fiji as Melanesian countries. So I think that would be, you know, it would be a hard, they would find that quite strange. Um, and, you know, obviously, if they, if we just see this kicking the can down the road, so for example, we've got elections coming up in Papua New Guinea, nothing's going to happen in relation to the Bougainville situation before the elections. I think it would be very strange to expect that it would. But Toarama has made it very clear that he is not going to um, allow this to become a the never ending story. He's made it very clear what he wants in quite trenchant terms. He, you know, he 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 sees that he has a a duty and an obligation to deliver to his people what they said they want. So as soon as the new government's installed, um, whether it's Marape at its head or someone else, I expect that we'll see Toarama agitating fairly early on for getting everybody back around the table and getting on with the work. So what should Papua New Guinea do here going forward now that Bougainville has voted for its own independence? If it lets Bougainville proceed down this path, it risks other parts of this decentralized nation of Papua New Guinea, a nation so large it would stretch from London to Estonia, breaking apart even further adding fuel to other independence movements throughout Papua New Guinea. On the other hand, if they try to prevent Bougainvillians departing and break international conventions, Port Moresby risks the wrath of partners in Australia, Melanesia, the US, even China. So how will Papua New Guinea tackle this complex issue? Well, to figure that out, we'll turn to our second guest. Part 2. Searching for Copper and Finding Gold Papua New Guinea is comprised of 836 languages and about six to 7,000 different you know, clan and tribal groups. Bougainville is, is, is um, one of those groups and within Bougainville, uh, there are also different groups within Bougainville who have uh, different dialects and languages as well in terms of um, you know, different settings that they are in. And, and, and there's a similar thing to other parts of Papua New Guinea, whereas, you know, I mean, where, for instance, if you go to the highlands of Papua New Guinea, again, you've got that sense of highly diverse people, despite the fact that they are from the highlands of Papua New Guinea. Bal Kama is a professor of international law at the Australian National University, specialising in the relationship between the arms of government under Papua New Guinea. Bal has written numerous fantastic works around the subject, and we're thrilled to have him join us today. When the uh, Germans and British government and later uh, the Australian government, when they first came, you know, the, they were thinking that um, they could easily colonize the country and impose a more centralized uniform system. But they realized that Papua New Guinea is, is definitely complex uh, and, and a central government doesn't work. And so that was a struggle during colonialism and when the Papua New Guinean uh, leaders, when they took over the country in 1970, or from late 1960s up to 1974, when they were drafting the constitution, they deliberately decided to create a decentralized system, recognizing that you can't govern this highly diverse, highly fragmented society with a central authority. You have to decentralize power so that uh, people who have been independent previously to colonization can feel that they are still in control of their destiny, they're still in control of decision making, and they have leaders within the local level who can take responsibility of their own people while being part of a central 
a system or a, a unified nation. And so that struggle of trying to unite the country and recognizing the diversity uh, continues and the government system is, is in place, the decentralized system. So if these differences between Papua New Guinea and Bougainville have been existing for decades now, why wait this long to have the independence movement and the referendum? Why not split this up 20 years ago? There was uh, the efforts made in the 70s for Bougainville to be an independent nation. In fact, uh, some of their leaders led by Father John Momus, who later became the driver of the PNG constitution, uh, and who was the president of Bougainville, or who was the who was the former president of Bougainville? He was really pushing for Bougainville's independence at the UN in the 1970s, and, and, and you know, prior to Papua New Guinea gaining the independence. And then, uh, the obviously the international community, the UN didn't give that mandate. So when he came back from that with his leaders and with his ideas and also recognizing also the Papua New Guinean leaders at the, at the time, recognizing that this issue of decentralization, giving a sense of autonomy to the province to operate is important to prevent further sort of fragmentation, created the decentralization system. And that in a way creates a compromise um, for you know provinces like Bougainville to not be pushing hard on, on their need to be independent. I think when it comes to the 80s um, with the mining, the Panguna mine that has happened on, on Bougainville and when the Bougainvillians realized that that mine when it, it was in its full operation was one of the largest in the world uh, and it was actually creating a lot of revenue for the country but they are not getting the benefits that they, they feel they deserved. Uh, obviously that created that sense of resentment resulted in that conflict with the Papua New Guinean government. Consensus that was reached for the unity of Bog Bougainville and rest of Papua New Guinea became a contentious point um, in that one of the factors, one of the factors, the mining royalties or the resource royalties were not evenly distributed or were considered to be unfairly distributed. And that is a point of contention for other parts of Papua New Guinea. It, at this present time as well. And I think for Bougainville, um, with that conflict and the losses on both sides uh, and, the, and the peace that came into play in, uh, in 1998, I think it, it does take a bit of time for people to get over the conflict, uh, get over the losses and really get the emotional part out of it and really I think uh, feel like they could they could make a reasonable case to Papua New Guinea, and when that when that time is right, and I think that resulted in the in the referendum that we've seen recently, in that they feel that was the right time. But the other thing that's important was Papua New Guinean leaders who were willing to work with Bougainville, and I think uh, the previous leaders uh, were focusing more on the peace peace agreement and the, and the peace uh, peace aspect, which is quite important, but uh, probably weren't casting their mind too much about um, having that referendum sooner. Whereas, you know, when that leadership of James uh, Marape came in, he was, he was open to, to now pushing forward with that, with the referendum. And that provides a, a platform uh, for the Bougainville people to be involved in the referendum, which we saw. So there's now been talk of reopening the Panguna mine, one of the largest mines on the planet. With the mine reopening, who are the likely investors going to be and who's likely to make a lot of money off this? It's an interesting space to watch. Um, firstly, as uh, Father John Momus, um, who was the president, said once, he said, it is good to work with a devil you know. Um, and I think he was referring to Rio Tinto and its subsidiaries in that you've, you've worked with them. They understand your concerns. They understand, um, how you feel about the situation. They were part of the history. Uh, if they open, 
to work with you, then why not we can work together, given that we've had that understanding. So he was pointing to that. But at this time, uh, there are the investors that are also uh, looking up at Bougainville. Uh, obviously, China, and we've heard about you know, investors from, uh, from Canada and some others here in Australia. So I think that is a decision that, or there is a space that is quite dynamic at this at this at this stage. Who is who is going to be the key player? Who who are going to be the support players? And and um, as they talk about re re engaging people on Panguna again, we, we should also think about it is one thing for the government to decide who the players are, and also it is the other thing for the landowners to be comfortable with who the players that they think they will work best with. So. When it comes to talking about who would be the key players in Bougainville, I would think there are two sides to it. One is what the government prefers, uh, wanting to work with, and the other one is is what the landowners also think about uh, what a key player should be. If Bougainville does get into independence smoothly and does come out better from this process, do you think we might see islands like New Ireland or New Britain pull for independence as well? It is a very contentious subject, uh, and as I pointed out earlier on, that some of the uh, provinces in Papua New Guinea who have a, uh, a large resource-based, natural resource-based mining and petroleum uh, are quite interested in, in claiming a greater sense of autonomy in running their provinces. So. This is a this is an issue that the leaders of Papua New Guinea are really sensitive about is to what extent granting Bougainville uh, independence would impact on the other provinces that have the capacity to claim autonomy in that to what extent would their claim be in terms of the autonomy and therefore independence if you you know if you want to pull that pull that string. I think some of the governors of the provinces have indicated that Bougainville would be setting a pace for, for us to also ask the government, the national government, to consider us in terms of the autonomy. I don't think they will, at this stage, uh, they will claim independence ex explicitly and directly as Bougainville. So East New Britain, New Ireland, Anger Province, um, Southern Highlands Province, for instance, with the LNG gases. I don't think they will be claiming independence, but I think um, they might see the need for a greater autonomy. Um, certainly the New Island Province under Sir Julius Chain has um, explicitly indicated that they want greater autonomy. So those voices will become larger. So we are starting to see a lot of Chinese money popping up in this area of the world, particularly in islands like Tulagi in the Solomons. Are we likely to see China putting large sums of money towards Bougainville very soon as well? I think the uh, some of the pioneering leaders of Bougainville and who are still alive and have have ongoing significance in in leading the Bougainville towards its path of autonomy and towards uh, its claim to independence uh, also have good relationships with. China and they have you know for instance have official capacities dealing with on behalf of Papua New Guinea dealing engaging with China the current leadership in Bougainville is actually open to developers coming in um, doesn't really specify who the developers are if anyone is interested to build Bougainville up and obviously in the post-conflict state as you would understand a uh, post-conflict nation is or uh, post-conflict settings are always in uh, need for, you know, infrastructure development and other things. Which, which China as a as a big funder for projects in the region, I think there will be a reception in Bougainville for them. To what extent they would whether they would match the Australian uh, sort of presence, or they would go above and beyond that. It's a question that I don't think it's a there's an easy answer to it because obviously we, much of the things that China does is is, is a not you know clear for us to 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 make some bold predictions. But I think 
the atmosphere, the leadership and the context in Bougainville would be open to developers, uh, to partners that they would consider would be would be useful to developing their provinces and building trade linkages and going to investments in their in their provinces. So, and, and that clearly puts China in the light. Just recently in late November of last year, saw a spate of large anti-China riots. See, the government of the Solomon Islands, following a trend we see wide across the globe, switched their recognition from the Republic of China, Taiwan, to the People's Republic of China, China. Upon this switch of recognition, riots broke out throughout the nation's capital, as people worried about the increasing influence of Chinese money in the country. This is one of the first major pushbacks we've seen in this area of the world, an area that is in desperate need of foreign investment. But whilst other nations' focuses were elsewhere, these riots definitely caught the attention of planners in Beijing. Is this a signal for the beginning of wider pushback against China throughout Polynesia and Melanesia? Or will this just encourage China to be quieter and more discreet with their investments into these sensitive areas? Well, to answer that, we turn to our third guest. Part 3. Island Hopping really at the heart of Australian engagement in the Pacific, certainly with much more emphasis in the last uh, five years, is the idea of uh, partnership and agency, not colonialism and paternalism. As we know, with the collapsing boundaries between what are strategic issues, what are technological issues, what are economic issues and what are environmental issues, uh, not everything uh, is viewed through a security lens if you're going to succeed. Michael Shoebridge is the Director for Defence, Strategy and National Security at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, specialising in Australia's engagement strategy. He's written a number of great articles in this subject, and we're very happy to have him on the show today. Well, I think the big idea is in that, uh, in that term, the Pacific family. Um, Australia lives uh, in the same part of the world as our South Pacific partners, and we don't have a choice of location, like you don't have a choice which family you're born into. And uh, unlike transactional relationships and distant interests, this uh, proximity uh, gives a set of obligations and connections that are inescapable. And with the set of challenges that our world has, uh, you know, I would say there are uh, four C's, COVID, climate change and China. Uh, these, this sense of connection that's captured in the Pacific family idea, I think gives the broad arc for Australian policy. Australia has deep ties in many of these Pacific nations, with some even choosing to use the Australian dollar as the default currency. So how did Australia create these sort of ties in a region you would assume the US would be far more dominant in? Well, there's the classic diaspora effect. So a lot of uh, families across the South Pacific have their children educated in Australia. Uh, That creates long-term deep connections. Uh, There's a bunch of scholarship programs that facilitate that. Uh, more at the uh, university level, so it continues out of the uh, the junior and high school system. There's standing uh, development assistance that's been provided to South Pacific uh, countries, uh, and there are enormous cultural, religious, and sporting connections. And there's the Defence Cooperation Program, which probably one of the most visible, uh, but fairly low key things that's been in place. Uh, since uh, since the independence of PNG, is things like the Pacific Patrol Boat Program, which has been helping South Pacific countries uh, protect and exert their sovereignty in the maritime space, and of course be part of protecting um, and managing one of their most valuable sources of revenue, their fisheries resources. But there's a downside to it all too, which is... Um, Australian policy hasn't always been focused as much as it needs to be on the South Pacific. Uh, We've wandered off to other priorities and we've rediscovered the South Pacific from time to time. 
And just as in a family where, you know, if, if a family member uh, isn't seen to have taken a sustained interest in someone else, that affects the relationship, as does uh, having administered a place like PNG as a trust territory uh, as a result of world war. So there's some tensions in the relationships as well. Well, you mentioned New Zealand there. So what are New Zealand's aims in this region of the world and how do they dovetail in with the Australians? I think they fit very well with the Pacific family idea, but I think New Zealand has uh, looked at the South Pacific that way uh, more seriously and more deeply for longer than Australia. And I think that is really because of the deep um, family connections uh, in New Zealand and across you know, Micronesia, Melanesia, Polynesia. So uh, it's a it's it's been a more baked in part of New Zealand policy. Uh, and there's the fact that Australia is the bigger nation in the region, and that gives New Zealand some distinct advantages in uh, differentiating from Australia. But I think that you know if I could put it as broadly as possible, the South Pacific family concept is realizing we're in a more interconnected, intermingled relationship that's only going to grow as the challenges from things like public health, as we see with the current COVID pandemic, and the multiple challenges to Australia, New Zealand, and South Pacific societies from climate change uh, unfold, and as the intensity of the strategic assertive power of China grows. All of these things mean we are going to be in a more integrated set of relationships with the South Pacific. So in Australian foreign policy circles, there are a few camps of people, all of which are competing for the same pot of money. Some believe we should keep our main focus towards the Pacific, others believe we should be looking north toward Timor, Malaysia and Indonesia, and others think we should take advantage of our west coast facing toward India and Africa. What would you say to those people who think we put far too much emphasis on our Pacific front? Well, you don't get to choose your family or where you live, and it's not an either or thing. Now, this is a very similar argument to the major strategic challenge of our time, which is uh, what's the problem? Is uh, Russia in Europe the problem or is China in the Indo-Pacific the problem? The answer to that question is it's a connected strategic system. Russia and China pose a common strategic challenge to democratic powers, whether they're in Europe or the Indo-Pacific. And it's the same answer I'd give about when Australia looks at the world and where we are, does the Indian Ocean matter? Does Southeast Asia or the South Pacific matter? My answer is yes, they do. Uh, and proximity is relevant here. And uh, our South Pacific partners are very, very proximate to us. Uh, same explanation for the abiding uh, deep relationship with Indonesia. It's like, you know, if you speak to a real estate agent, what do they tell you is important? Three things. Location, location, location. So as it stands today, Australia has only set aside $50 million for investment in Bougainville, which effectively is nothing, particularly to Beijing, who views $50 million as less than pocket change. Are we likely to get financially muscled out by Beijing if they see any interest in this region? Uh, this isn't a matter of um, the victory goes to the highest bidder. Um, small Pacific states have an absorption capacity that's limited. And some of the scale of money and investment that might pour in uh, for um, quite self-interested purposes from China uh, is simply beyond the needs and beyond the absorptive capacity of the South Pacific. So we, Australia doesn't need to outbid China in dollar terms. We need to demonstrate everything we're saying about the Pacific family, that other relationships might be transactional and for their own purposes, but we have a sense of uh, a shared future and we mean it. So when we do something with Bougainville, it's sustained and it's not just for our transactional purposes. And I think that's a compelling uh, way of thinking that is quite distinctive from the, the bidding war concept that we see people talk about. Well, if it's not the bidding war that influences countries' decision, what pushed nations like the Solomons to switch their recognition from Taiwan to the People's Republic of China? 
Well, I'm not discounting that some of the elites certainly liked the bidding war. I saw you know, that statement of the Vanuatu and Foreign Minister a little while ago where he said something pretty much, well, let me paraphrase him, but it was to this effect. Uh, look, uh, we love Chinese interests in our country and in our region because they make us a whole lot of offers and they compel our other longer term partners like Australia and New Zealand to make counter offers. And so this is very good for us. Now, that can be quite a widespread view um, in the political levels of, of South Pacific countries, and it's understandable, partly because of that periodic inattention that I spoke about from Australia and our South Pacific partners. But uh, to view this as simply transactional, and it doesn't matter whether I get um, my investment and partnership with China or Australia, is to discount the value side of the relationship. And as we see right now in Ukraine, and as we've seen graphically in Hong Kong and Xinjiang, values inform how a partner works. And it's more important than these transactional conversations from some of these South Pacific elites. I think South Pacific populations get this, and elites that are purely transactional and don't think about the values of partners like China and Australia and New Zealand uh, are likely to have a nasty surprise when they're out of step with their populations. So do you think this is going to be a continuing trend? We're going to see more nations switch their recognition from the Republic of China to the People's Republic of China going forward? Well, there aren't many left, but I think this is now a bigger question. Um, you know, that, that was a bidding war between Taiwan and China. But the more assertive and more authoritarian that China gets under Xi and the closer its partnership with the autocrat in Moscow, Vladimir Putin, the more offensive that is to the values, cultures and interests across the South Pacific. And elites that don't understand that and connect to their populations will be in trouble. It's like here in Australia. Uh, China policy has moved so rapidly and so deeply, not because of a cosy conversation in the parliament between political elites, but because of a population level assessment of how China is operating under Xi. So in democratic systems, the population's views matter more than the elites. And elites that forget that end up in trouble or out of office. So as it's shaping up at the moment, it seems that China and Australia will be the big influences inside Bougainville going forward. But why aren't we seeing Indonesia getting more involved with them being so close to the island? I think when Indonesia looks across at Melanesia and Micronesia, it looks at it through the lens of Irian Jaya. And it looks at it through the lens of maintaining Indonesia as a single unitary sovereign state. Uh, East Timor, I think, was a jarring experience and played to an underlying fear in Indonesian leaders and people about holding that uh, massive fragmented archipelago together. And so Irian Jaya is certainly their major lens for engaging with the South Pacific. That means I don't think they see a leadership role for themselves there because uh, it's hard to see uh, how they've managed Irian Jaya as a beacon of hope, as a leadership model for their engagement with the rest of the South Pacific. So I think it's mainly a defensive, protective mindset that they bring to their engagement. Well, does the US have a policy on Bougainville or is this something they will likely delegate for Australia to keep an eye on? Well, I think just as the US has realised that it's not sufficient unto itself in the world that we're living in, um, Australia realises it's not sufficient unto itself in relationships in the South Pacific. In fact, the democratic world's model of engagement is not to divide the world into spheres of influence. That's actually the model that Xi and Putin uh, told the world they wanted to see when they met just earlier uh, this year on the 4th of February in the margins of the Winter Olympics. So um, it's not a competitive environment between democracies in the South Pacific. 
And the reason that Australia is in the quad with India, Japan and the US, uh, and the reason that we're in so much of the multilateral architecture across the South Pacific and broader Indo-Pacific is uh, we like to have positive partners that are working with an underlying similar value set and common interests and welcoming the US, New Zealand, Japan, Taiwan, India in engaging with small island states uh, in the South Pacific is absolutely in our policy interests. And what do you think China's big goals inside Melanesia are? What countries do you think they're going to be putting the majority of their focus towards going forward? Well, I think uh, it's the resource vacuum cleaner, uh, and that's not new news. So it's fish, forestry, and other resources. Uh, and then strategic location. Uh, we know that the South Pacific was uh, a sought after strategic location during the Second World War. We know it was a big part of the Imperial Japan war plan to establish a standing military presence in the South Pacific. This is why some of the big battles, you know, why is Iron Bottom Sound called Iron Bottom Sound? Because of the amount of shipping sunk there during the Second World War. This is why there were some of the fierce battles in places like Bougainville. Um, it is a strategic location uh, to exert military power and prevent others from exerting military power. So that's a goal as well. So it's resources and strategic location. And people to people relationships come right at the bottom in the Chinese hierarchy of engagement, despite the bromides about mutual respect and win-win outcomes. And I think uh, there's a rising understanding of that across the South Pacific. China has recently put a lot of money into the island of Tulagi in the Solomon Islands. Do you think this is something we should be raising the alarm bell about or just stand in business? Well, uh, my view is uh, we should be, to quote John Howard, alert but not alarmed uh, across lots of the South Pacific because that transactional approach that I mentioned about uh, Chinese interest is good for us and we'll get better outcomes from our other partners is alive and well. And the it, it's actually the way the Chinese state has operated. It's how the Communist Party sees power through their United Front organisation, where they co-opt uh, organisations and institutions and individuals for particular purposes to splinter the coherence of any opposition to them. And once they've done that, they consolidate their position. So the transactional approach is actually playing right to China's mode of operating to corrupt and uh, co-opt uh, people, institutions, and whole countries, if they can. Uh, that's, that's the lens we should look at, at with Chinese engagement in the South Pacific, because there isn't a separation between the corporation and the state. And whatever autonomy Chinese companies had has been being ended under Xi. We see that across their corporate structure. But I suppose the, the iconic example is Jack Ma, the head, head of Alibaba, who had the temerity to think he was running his company. So um, a particular place, a particular location um, is important. But really, the phenomenon that Australia, New Zealand, the US, Japan, India, Taiwan need to, to look for indicators of is where are their circumstances where China can establish infrastructure that they will use as a place to project military power from. I'm not talking about bases so much. I'm talking about places where they just happen to spend a whole lot of time uh, and uh, give a sustained military presence from. The Bougainville referendum does put Australia in a bit of an awkward position, potentially. If Port Moresby chooses to ignore the results of the referendum and string out the independence for ages and ages and ages, what would Australia's response be? Should we keep our closest neighbour happy by supporting them in this? Or should we sign with the democratic rights of a nation of just 300,000 people? Well, back to the family concept. Um, I don't think Australia is, is going to take a policy position on what the outcome should be for Bougainville. This is something for the people of PNG, uh, which Bougainville is a part of, to settle uh, amicably between them. Um, this would be... 
if there are difficulties um, around uh, the implementation of uh, Bougainville's future, then I think this is a shared thing that the broader South Pacific family, including Australia and New Zealand, will have an interest in um, helping resolve. And, um, you know, you look at the past of Bougainville, um, the conflict that started there started over resources, money and Bougainville's future. And the way it ended up uh, being not quite completely resolved, but certainly resolved so that Bougainvillians could see a positive future for themselves, wasn't just PNG and it wasn't just Australia. It was a South Pacific effort uh, to help create a more peaceful environment there. So, you know, the, the, these things are the way that Australia has worked with South Pacific partners in many different examples. You know, Bougainville's one, uh, and the Solomon Islands with Ramsey is another. So it had, Australia's involvement will be, as part of the Pacific family, how can we help? I mean, it would be nice if we are able to work with both sides, but what would Australia do if Papua New Guinea went down the same road as Indonesia with West Papua and simply told us to back off and that this is an internal issue for Papua New Guinea? Well, that would be a failure of PNG leadership and policy and of the relationship with Australia. Uh, you look at, the, at Ramsey, um, you know, multi-year um, activity that had uh, a whole um, South Pacific uh, participation and it was at the invitation of the Solomon Islands government um, so that when um, they had their recent insecurity, it was the simple thing for the Solomon Islands leadership to call Australia and ask for assistance. That's the kind of partnership uh, that, that we need to create. And it isn't created um, by, uh, by a failure of national policy, whether that's in PNG or Australia. So uh, the future of Beauville is is a really difficult political, um, cultural and economic issue. Uh, the simple fact is it's hard to see a small state like Bougainville being sustainable by itself. And so there is a logic, even if that's not uh, fitting beautifully with the politics and the history, of being a part of PNG, absolutely. Um, that, so it's, it's good to have aspirations, but aspirations need practical, feasible implementation. And I suppose that's the risk about fast money transactional promises from a distant power like China. I mean, culturally, they are far closer to the Solomon Islands than they are Papua New Guinea. What would happen if they looked to join the Solomon Islands rather than gain their independence? And is that an option on the table for Bougainville? Well, again, um, I'd, I'd be a bit focused if I lived in Bougainville or, and in the Solomons about the practicalities of that. Um, starting with the economics. So, you know, I think a relationship um, between the Solomons and Papua New Guinea would be viable in that circumstance, but how viable is the resulting Solomon Islands economy and political entity? So, you know, I, I think, um, I, I always think that the policy and aspiration is the easy bit, the practical impl implementation is the hard bit. And returning to what I said towards the beginning, when you look at the challenges that small island states in the South Pacific face, whether it's COVID, climate change, or the fact uh, that China's projection of power means strategic competition has come to a place near them, um, managing this um, as small political entities without a deep sense of partnership with others would be a mistake. Obviously, recently, China has been using financial means to gain influence in these regions. But do you think China is watching what's happening in Ukraine at the moment and using that as a possible blueprint for Taiwan going forward? Well, I think the right lesson for the leaders in Beijing is to look at the incredible galvanising effects of powerful democratic countries from uh, the pursuit of change through conflict that Putin is inflicting on the 44 million people in Ukraine. So uh, if Beijing would like to further unify the powerful democratic world against it, then the best way of doing that 
would be to do what Putin is doing in Ukraine uh, against the people of Taiwan. I think that's the lesson they should take. The amount of strategic change uh, in a way that reinforces democratic powers, cohesion and values that Putin has achieved since he began his war in Ukraine is striking. But Australia and the US can afford to sanction Russia. We don't do a lot of business with those guys. Can we actually afford to sanction China? There's going to be economic blowback uh, because of the way these two particular authoritarian regimes want the world to work. And if we don't agree that the world should work that way, there are economic consequences for everybody. And you can see uh, when it comes down to actual values and how the world works and finances, world leaders choose values every time. If anyone hasn't read the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz's speech from the 27th of February, they should because it shows that in action. So uh, the economics are interesting. The values are compelling. And my last question, what do you see as the big issues for Melanesia going forward over the next five to 10 years? I think it's the challenges, the four Cs. Uh, it's COVID, which is still not over, and it's leaving enduring economic and social damage. Uh, climate change, which we can see right now, I'm sitting here in Canberra, only expecting 40 millimetres of rain today while much of the East Coast is expecting 200 millimetres of rain. That's coming on the back of uh, a flood not so long ago and a national bushfire season before that. And the countries of the South Pacific know this even better than I do sitting here in, in Canberra. So the cumulative effects of, of climate change, um, COVID and aggressive Chinese power, um, combined with a, a much stronger, more cohesive uh, set of relationships between democratic countries. And I include the South Pacific there. Anybody who knows me well knows I'm a big World War II buff. And looking at all the maps this week, many of the key battles and turning points of that war continue to stick out to me as important areas today. It was the battles in Bougainville, Guadalcanal in the Solomons, and Kokoda in Papua New Guinea that blunted the Japanese land campaigns. This is as far as the East Asian power ever extended, and Japan never stretched any further out. Fast forward almost 80 years now, and it's Chinese influence that's now spreading out from East Asia, not by tanks or aircraft, but by economics. Will these key island chains that have already begun protest against Chinese influence be the far reaches of the East Asian influence once again? Or is this the beginning of a new charm offensive into these small Pacific states? This is the question Australia has to ask, and the time is running out to answer it. Thank you for tuning into the show this week. Last month was another record month for the program. I've been saying to the team each and every month that this month's growth can't be sustainable. It's just a random spike, but time and time again, we keep smashing our records. So to all of the new listeners who've come onto this program and have checked us out over the last two months, from the bottom of my heart, welcome to the show and thanks for supporting us. It means a lot to have you here. This year has already kicked off to a raring start and we've been busier than ever before, creating extra analysis pieces, a special mini series, extra content on our website, and much more, which you can all find at theredlinepodcast.com. If you want to be alerted to everything right away, though, you can keep up to date with everything we're doing on our Reddit, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, and TikTok on the handle at the Red Line Pod. Or you can follow me on Twitter on the handle at Mike Elliott Oz. Oz is in Australia. This episode is dedicated to friend of the show, Gary Anderson, who is the latest Patreon to sign up as of time of recording. This show is only possible with the support of our listeners like Gary, who donate a small amount of money each month to help us keep the show going, and we cannot thank him enough. If you feel you could spare a couple of dollars, we'd greatly appreciate him. So Gary, this episode on Bougainville is for you. As usual, here are our three book recommendations. The first is A Death in the Rainforest by Don Kulik for a look at the various cultures of Papua New Guinea. The second is Bloody Bougainville by Chris Glatt for a look at the importance of Bougainville during the Second World War. 
And the third is The Ark of Instability by Matthias Emero for a wider look at Melanesia. I want to say thanks to this week's guests, Tess newton Kane, Val Karma, and Michael Shoebridge. All of you are fantastic to have on the program. I also want to thank my staff, Owen Swift, the producer, Wade McCaw, our incoming producer, Perry Grace, Daniela Zivella, Andrew Garbery, and Robbie Sutton, our research assistants and writers, Mark Spencer, our second voiceover artist, Ross Cramtree, our media specialist, Joe Hawthorne, our audio cleaner, Marissa Rafter, our videographer, Nick Much, our field correspondent, as well as Jonah Gunn, our new production assistant. I'm incredibly proud of this team and looking forward to all the great things coming up. The Red Line will be back in another fortnight with another international episode. But until then, thank you for listening and good night. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of Michael, our guests, and the Red Line podcast. They do not represent any government or organization and are solely our own. For more information, please visit theredlinepodcast.com.